How's everybody doing? Good, enjoying the off season? And, uh, oh, there we go. Um, a little downtime. Um, so we are going to dive right in. If you've been with us, we've been on a long journey for the book of Revelation, and we are coming to the end of chapter 20 and kind of getting into a little bit of 21 um, this morning. So if you want to find your way there, we're going to be starting in Revelation 20, verse 11. But uh, uh, this morning's question, or what we're going to look at, is this idea of what is overwhelming you. And uh, <clears throat> we didn't talk, but it, it's amazing, you know, obviously how God works things out with the worship team and reading over and over again this morning um, the, the account of Mary and Martha. And um, folks, this is the, uh, the reality. We are either being overwhelmed by the world or by the Lord. And, um, and it's our choice. We'll talk about that. But ultimately, that's what it boils down to, and that's what just kept uh, living in as they kept repeating that scripture in worship this morning, uh, was, you know, Martha, you're so distracted with so many things. She was overwhelmed. The things of the world, the cares of the day, the cares of the evening. Um, but old Martha, or Mary, as Jesus said, she's, she's chosen the best thing. And Mary had the opportunity to be overwhelmed with Jesus, completely focused and just overwhelmed with her Lord. Everything else, all the other cares in the world, everything else just kind of faded away, right, from all that. Um, so I just thought before we dive in this morning, I was sitting there and I, I don't know, but I just want to give the time. We've got to, I think the mic down here, but as the worship team was leading us this morning through that, those, um, you know, over and over again, just to let that sink in, I was just curious if, that, if somebody just has something, just a, a word of encouragement, something that, boy, the Lord met you. The Lord brought conviction or the Lord just brought you to that place with Mary. Something just that you want to just share up here before we get in this morning. Just want to give the chance to uh, let the body respond right, to that time of worship, if you had something there that like, wow, Lord, you're speaking to me. Anybody? Just got anything? Come on, make yeah. Awesome. It was probably just the really cute worship pastor that um, yeah. led me to. Yeah, I know that. It kind of moved you, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> I'm very cute, just to clarify. Um, we have two seniors, and so we are living in the world's busiest time right mm. now and I, I was like may 1st no mm -hmm. um and we have been spinning at a pace that's not super healthy mm. and it is interesting that this happened this morning because it is exactly what i've been praying for about a month of just being trying to be present mm. and not look back and go oh my gosh we missed it we missed this last month of busy 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 so mm. as i loved how we did it three times and um each time i just kind of kept picturing us hosting our graduation party and all the events we're going to and just stopping, praising, and just enjoying it yeah, that's instead it. of just spinning, mm. um, which is what I'm really good at doing. So mm. <laughs> thank you for that. Whomever had that idea this morning, Dan, mm. thank you. He'll take Maybe credit you for it, even your if wife it wasn't needed his. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Meg. Yeah, I... Um, <clears throat> Well, especially in those big transitions, right, with, with kids is the Lord meets us in that, in the blessings of, of family and kids. Um, and I think sometimes it takes three, four, five times in the same, ver in the same thing, right, to, to soak it up. And uh, so thank y'all for that this morning. Um, I think that's, that's fantastic. But folks, I, I just, again, if you miss everything else, we're going to dive into some deep water this morning. Of course, you, many of you said, we've been in deep water. This whole book is deep water, right? Uh, but hold on to this. What is overwhelming you? Right? There's only two options. There isn't a middle zone or another zone. It's either the world and everything in life or it's the Lord. 
And uh, there isn't this kind of other zone. It's either the kingdom of the world, or the kingdom of God. And that's our choice. This is where faith comes in. This is where um, we're going to see, are we thirsty, right, for the, the things of the Lord? All right, so let me take us a little deeper, okay? I want to ask you a big question. This is a tough one. You believe that God has the right to judge your life. Do you believe that God has the right to judge your life? Whew, that's kind of a big turn, right? Whew, she went down there. Mm. Now, I'm going to show, the, the Word of God this morning is going to show us why this is such a critical question to the gospel and how it has been amazingly left out of the discussion. More than you realize. And so what, what I want to sink in is there is no understanding the grace of God. There is no understanding the mercy of God. There is no understanding the gospel or the need for it unless I start here. Unless I start here. Um, and so there's three options for us all. And uh, the first one is this. We believe that God exists and we are accountable to him. Um, as some have said, you know, we believe there's a God and we're not him, <laughs> right? We believe this is, this is the place that scripture is speaking to and that most people in the context of history would believe, okay? Second one is we believe God exists, but we don't live like we're accountable to him. Yeah, there's a God out there, but I'm going to do my own thing, All right? And the third one is we don't believe God exists, um, and therefore we're accountable to ourselves. Um, and folks, just uh, I'm not going to take too long. Just one thing, I, I've got a lot here that we could just break down culturally just to show um, what has been taught and is being taught to our children and that permeates and radically comes in the church and impacts our view of the grace of God and the mercy of God, the greatness of the gospel. And uh, but here's just one. Many of you, um, if you haven't studied uh, John Paul Sartre um, and some of the other philosophers um, that have so impacted our, our educational system, um, this is one. He, he stated that man is nothing else but that which he makes of himself. That's modern education. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. That's the message 24-7 going to your child, going in our culture today. And that man bears the entire responsibility of his existence squarely upon his shoulders. Um, now think about the ramifications of that. Um, that is our culture. That's Western Philosophy, that is the, the culture we live in. And, 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 and we're going to talk and see how that, what happens when that creeps in the church. But this is the incubator of so many of our anxieties where we are overwhelmed by the world. This is the reason why we have an anxiety problem today. This is the sole reason. This is the base reason. It's because our children, why? Around the world, we are the most affluent. Our children have more safety, more blessings than any children in the history of the world. Why do we have a suicide problem that we have? Why do we have all the anxiety we have? It's because our children have been taught that they're the center of the universe. And with that comes a complete bearing on their shoulders, everything, the entire responsibility of their existence on their shoulders. And that gives nowhere for the soul and the longings of the soul to go, right? To lay hold of answers, right, in, in life. And it erodes the essential first part of the gospel. I have to know I need God. I need his forgiveness um, before I can receive the grace of God. Before I even understand the, without understanding that we stand before a God who is just and righteous and justly to keep us accountable, we can't understand the gift of grace of God. And so this is real important today in our culture because of these things. I could go over many, many more, but sin has been redefined as just dysfunction. 
Okay, I just want you to think about what you read and what your kids are being taught. Sin is just dysfunction today. Redemption is just recovery. And that is crept into the church, is crept into how we talk about the gospel, how we talk about the truth of God. And, um, and this brought a, brought a great corruption. It's eroded some of the greatness of, of, of understanding the primary things that re, are essential for the soul to receive the redemption that comes in God and God alone through Jesus Christ and His amazing forgiveness. And so... This big question of, man, um, does God have the right to judge my life? For the gospel and the good news to take hold, I have to understand and be there for me to get to the next great question. Do I believe that God is merciful, gracious, loving enough to save me? Right? That second question is where we've hung out, but we've couched sin as, oh, this is just dysfunction. It just needs to be some therapy fix to, and redemption is just, oh, it's a recovery process. Folks, that is not the gospel. The gospel is much bigger than that. Sin is a breach before a holy God that leaves me accountable before a holy God with eternity in the balance. Redemption only comes, it's not just recovery. It's something massively larger, all right, redemption is salvation at the core of who I am, saved out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, where I desperately need God, and only God can do that in my life and in the world. So we need a Savior, right, to come and to, to save us. And so what, because of this, is we have kind of, you know, put a little mushiness, a little uh, comfort around the gospel, and we've tried to go about and focus on the second question. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he's merciful and gracious and he wants to save you? We've thrown that one out. We've camped out there all day long, but we've never dealt with the first fundamental question. Do you realize that no one can understand the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the true magnitude of he forsook his own son? He gave his son for us. I thought we might live. And if he did that, Romans 8, 32 says that how much more will he give us all things? We will never understand that until I get the first one right. That I am desperately before a holy God and I desperately need his forgiveness and his salvation in my life because I stand accountable to a holy God who created me. Do you see the connection? Do you see how most more than we'd ever realized in the church, we camp out on that second question without dealing with the first one. And you wonder why when you talk to people about the gospel today that it's just like, huh, it becomes a therapeutic question. Well, Jesus is good for you, man. He's, he's, wow, is he, he makes you feel good. He builds you up and everything like that. It will only stay there in the dysfunction and recovery realm if we don't take the conversation to the first and foremost. Why did Jesus, when he began his ministry, what's the first thing he says? Right, they summarize, the gospel summarizes this message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Without repentance, without understanding our position before a holy God, there is no grace. There is no understanding of mercy of God. There's no understanding of the love of God. Because fundamentally, I'm just saying, well, I'm just a little dysfunctional, but I'm good, I'm okay. I deserve a good life, right? Instead of just the opposite of what the Bible says, I'm a sinner. I'm broken, I'm separated from the love of God and all of God for all eternity. I'm in darkness unless, unless God graciously reaches down and saves me. Does that make sense, gang? Do you see how radical the position we're in today? In our own personal lives, our own understanding of, of what the gospel actually is? We're missing it more than we realize. Because again, culture, the world has been overwhelming us rather than the presence of a glorious, holy, loving, merciful God and the stirring of my great need, my desire, my, my thirst in my soul for him, right? And so that leads us in to um, Revelation and um, folks, we're just a culture today that is doing everything it can to evade any objective evaluation of our life. 
Does that make sense? Think about our culture. Think about our children. Think about authority structures. Think about the cancel culture. Think about everything going on. We think about everything going on just in our own country. Nobody owning responsibility for anything. Right? We're a culture that is evading any objective ability to look at my life. Right? It's just a matter of dysfunction. It's just a matter of right, something we just need recovery from. Rather than needing a savior and needing radical redemption from. All right. Let's dive in. Um, <clears throat> so, a little background here. Um, and, and again, I encourage you to go back and listen to previous messages to get a context. But just step back in the beginning of 20. We talked about last week the millennium and, and us, where we fit into this, this big picture of what God is doing. He's reigning and ruling. And I'm going to step back in verse, um, uh, let's see, where will I go? Um, the end of verse 4 of chapter 20. And he says, they came to life and they reigned, speaking about, the, these are believers. They came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years is ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Um, over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. There is the heritage of those who are children of God who've given their life to Jesus. And we talked about last week, just real quick, that um, in my perspective of the millennium is that that was inaugurated with the kingdom when Jesus came, his death, his resurrection. And we're in the midst of that, of his church living out the millennium, uh, the reigning and ruling, being priests, the church representing the kingdom of God, giving off the good news, the great commission, taking this amazing message to the ends of the earth, to the nations of the world. And... Um, and this reigning and ruling, this first resurrection is I mean, when we die, we have the assurance, no matter when we die, that we're present with God, the great cloud of witnesses that's reigning and ruling with Christ, that's returning to, uh, that's waiting to return with Christ to this earth to bring in the final um, kingdom and uniting all things in heaven and on earth. Uh, and then the, we, if we keep reading, we, like we did t last week, we talked about the great battle, right? When Jesus returns. And uh, brings complete justice to this world. But then there's a next thing that happens at the end. Starting in verse 11. And when I saw it, then I saw a great white throne. And him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead. Now this is specifically what I just read. Those who don't know Jesus, those who died without him, right? Who were in the realm of the dead, which just means separation from God. Great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. Folks, remember, if you've been with us, the whole idea of sea, this is not the, the sea, though the sea represents, the sea is that place of chaos in the world. The book of Revelation, the Antichrist, the beast, all these um, evil things are what rise up out of the sea, right? Out of the darkness. Gave up the dead, which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead, with which are in it. Um, they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And that is the second death, the lake of fire, which we just read further. Those in the first resurrection, those who know Jesus, the second death has no power over them. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Other places where the book of life is talking, also called the Lamb's book of life. It is those who know Jesus, whose names are written in the family of God because they are a child of God and they know Jesus. Now, folks, this is, the, and we could go back to Daniel chapter 7 and, and chapter 4 and chapter 5 in Revelation to the throne room. This is the presence of God. And this language, all, you know, heaven and sky fled away, right, from the presence. In other words, the imagery there is the absolute overwhelming sense of being in the presence of the Almighty. Everything else fades away. Everything else flees away 
It's the ultimate exposure, right, of being in the presence of the one who, as the scripture says, sees all, knows all, um, in the presence of God. And I come back to the question we started with. Either I'm being overwhelmed by the presence of God or by the world. And Mary and Martha is a beautiful being just that daily thing of either being overwhelmed by the things of the world or I'm overwhelmed sitting at the feet of Christ, learning how to enjoy his presence. And what this passage says is, is that there'll be a day for those who reject him, right? Those who have no thirst for God, those who in those categories we saw who don't either believe there's a God, but ah, don't want anything to do with him now, or those who don't believe there's a God and are just living their life, that everyone is going to have to stand and is going to be overwhelmed at some point by who God is. There is an accounting. This lie that's in our world right today that says, ah, just live your life. You are accountable to you, ultimately, is a lie from the pit of hell. And we just know it just doesn't play out, just even practically in life, it doesn't work out. But there is an accounting. And folks, I just, uh, as hard as this is to talk about, this is not held up today when the gospel is preached. The gospel is turned into some therapeutic, again, dealing with dysfunction, dealing with people's little problems. It's not first and foremost dealing with the main problem. My position before God, my need for a savior. And I will never understand the full overwhelming nature of the grace and mercy of God unless I first understand my great need for God and my need to repent, right? Verse in chapter 21. And then I saw a new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. This doesn't mean there's not going to be a beautiful ocean recreated. This means the sea of chaos, what the sea represents in Revelation and all the Old Testament, a place of chaos, the place of darkness that births evil into the world. Um, And so before Jesus can unite all things in heaven and earth, before the new creation comes, there has to be a reckoning. And we see this all through, whether it's Old Testament, New Testament, it's prophesied. It is everywhere. But again, today, and, and so much in the church, we've done everything to shy away from. There's, there's whole movements of Christianity to America that are just do away with any punitive aspect of the scripture altogether because they've bought a therapeutic gospel. They've bought an idea that, oh, God's just all love and no justice. You'll find it nowhere right in, in the scripture. Man, this is awesome. Look at I saw new heavens and new earth. This is your heritage. And this is what we call people to. Of the love of God, what he wants to do. Fundamentally, the gospel. Oh, he's going to take care of my specific issues in my life, but he can't do that until I'm his. Until he's taking care of the ultimate issue in my life. Of where my soul is. And have I been, 1 Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Have I been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son? That is the fundamental question. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That's God's heart more than anything. From the very beginning of the garden, God wants to dwell with you. He wants to fellowship with us. That is what is to be taking place when we come to communion, when the church gathers. Why we're to gather regularly is to celebrate his promised presence even now with us, right, in the hopes of understanding. Ultimately, he's going to work all things out and create a, a newness in this creation where he can dwell again with us, even better than the Garden of Eden. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them them as their God. Now listen to this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Folks, just soak it up. But you know what? You can't get there until there's justice. And this is really, really important. People say, well, gosh, 
man, if some people don't make, look at what's going to happen here. How can I not be mourning and crying in eternity when all this other stuff we're reading about happens? Because guess what? He's going to make all things new. And there's a sense of you can't make all things new until, right, justice comes. And that, that, that's just a practical thing in life today. There is no making all, there is no healthy recovery or moving forward to anything until there's a sense of justice, right? And forgiveness and all these things. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. The old order of things is gone. Folks, this is your heritage. This is the whole plan of the cosmos in this world of when God um, hovered over the waters and, and created this, spoke it into being and created you, uniquely you in his image to have fellowship with you and to share his creation that you would take dominion and you will in the new creation. He's got a heritage for you far beyond what you, and, and in the next couple of weeks, we're going to get into this exciting stuff about what this eternal life has waiting for us. Behold, I'm making all things new. And also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Now listen to this. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, the liar, all liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire, sulfur, which is the second death. Mm. It's the only place we see this word cowardly. And in the context of Revelation, it is those who in light of the pressure of the world cave in in the testimony. Those who let fear override rather than faith. Those who turn and hold on to the world rather than the word of God. And they're faithless. And we see this theme all through, right? The scripture, the detestable. Those who honor and who embrace the things that God sees as abomination. Those who are murderers. Jesus said those who hate their brothers and sisters. Those who, who embrace the cancel culture. Those who embrace hate. Those who uh, embrace um, that, that way of living, right? Sexually immoral. Whoa. The lake of fire. Those who reject God's order of purity will not have a place with God. This is tough stuff. There's an accountability to a holy God. We can't just think, oh, God exists, and he's a gracious God, but I'm going to live like I want to live, and I'm going to embrace what the world says. It couldn't be any clearer here as it is all through the scripture. We cannot be a people who are sucked into the way of the world, and are we going to be cowards? Are we going to be faithless in light of what culture is putting our way? Are we going to be faithless? And to cave in and start like, you know, talking about, well, love is love and or are we going to stand for what God, what pleases a holy God? What he's laid out from the very beginning is this is sacred. This is holy. This is what the context of the beauty of sexual purity. And this is not talking about people because we've all are guilty of <laughs> probably all these things, right? And this is the beauty of the, this is, this is the difference. But, but if I say, Lord, I am desperate before you, I'm guilty you have a faithful advocate, a savior who will wash his, First John says, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, no matter how unrighteous it is. That's the good news today. To live blamelessly, not by his blood, by the covering of his, his blood, but to go through life and to hold on to these things and practice these things, there's a day of accountability. There's a day of reckoning. And there's an eternity that's called the second death that there is no return from. The sorcerers. Let me just try to describe this in modern terms. These are those who embrace an alternate reality. These are those who through drugs and media or whatever try to lead people into a different reality. Sorcerers. And embrace mediums and everything else. 
idolaters. We all fall into that. It's honoring anything worthy, worshiping anything other right, than God as Mary sat at the feet, right, consumed by who he is. All liars. Satan is the father of lies to be able to live a life that it's okay to lie. Folks, do I need to ask you? Do we live in a culture that is... Where has accountability gone? Where has accountability to somebody's words, where has the, the idea of lying gone in our country? It's just part of our culture. But you cannot be a liar outside of being broken before God and forgive me for this and, and desiring change and ex- expect to be in the presence of God. And so I want to focus just in closing on these last two things or back to, um, step back to this idea. To the thirsty, I'll give the springs of the water of life. And to the one who conquers, um, they will have the heritage of God. And just in closing, this question. Do you believe God is gracious, merciful, to save you? To save you. This is not a recovery Christianity is not a recovery process. It's a radical transformation. It's a new life. It radically changes your identity, who you are, and your destiny. And without it, there is no redemption. There is no salvation. There is not a heritage of God moving forward. It is what we just read right here. It's the lake of fire. And I don't even want to think about what that is. Do you believe that God's gracious and merciful? And folks, I, I can't get there. Mercy and grace make absolutely no sense outside of the context of first understanding that I am desperate before a holy God. I need Him to be gracious to me. And so, I think this is where it comes when I look at it. Wow, Lord, how, how do I do this? How do I become merry and not be consumed with, with the things of the world and the cares of the world? And how do, I, how do I do this? How do I get overwhelmed by you, God? Well, there's some simple things, right? It's just simple choice, as we said. It's right, sitting at the feet of Jesus, making a conscious decision on certain things. But I just give you these two words. One is thirsty. I know my own life is that that's where, the, that's where the slide starts going real quick, is when I am not thirsty for God. Is because then if I'm not thirsty for God, guess what happens? There's no gray zone. I become thirsty for the things of the world. And that quickly slides me away about, and, and, and I can't be a conqueror. In other words, I can't live with victorious faith in the midst of a lack of thirst is I'm not going to to have a vision for the heritage of God. Those who conquer have the heritage of God. All of these things, all the blessings and promises of God, I'm not going to pursue those things. And so now it raises the question, well, how do I stay thirsty? How do I stay thirsty? And folks, um, that's a big question. And all of us, have to answer that and look inside our soul, but I would just say there's simple context, right, for this, and this is why we so desperately need the fellowship of believers in a smaller discipleship context is to really be involved in each other's lives. Are you thirsty? And to call it out in each other when we get dull and numb, because I'm telling you that today, it happens quick. With our children, if there's no thirst for God, I can tell you where their thirst is going to be, where they're gonna, that appetite is going to go. The soul is, is, a thir- is thirsting. Our soul is thirsting. It's, it's hungry for something. The world is constantly saying, here, be satisfied with this. And God is shouting in the church, and we should be shouting to others, no, no, that is not going to satisfy. Come and sit at the feet right of Jesus. Um, Dan, y'all, y'all come on up. and um, I just want to pray for us. And uh, in light of um, the word of God here, and just have him speak to us. Uh, and I think just step back into where the worship team has taken us. Um, I know in my own life, 
that God has had to take me to a certain place of struggle, um, even now, you know, with certain wrestles, um, because it, it, it is hard, isn't it? It is a struggle to stay thirsty for God. There's so many distractions. And to just, like, uh, I think what the Lord revealed in my life is, man, I want to be Martha, Mary, and I'm, I'm sitting there. But then what happens, I quickly, it's back and forth. It's back and forth. I, I'm, I'm Mary for a second, and then I get distracted, and I'm, boom, I'm, I'm Martha. And to be able to tarry, it's an old word, to be able to wait, to wait there for Jesus to overwhelm me. We need each other. Remember, that's a communal thing. Nobody can do that alone. You can have the best prayer room in the world. But if you don't learn how to tarry, wait, enjoy the presence of God in community, your time alone is going to quickly fade. And vice versa. We need both, right, to come together. So Father, thank you. Lord, for your word this morning. And Lord, may it come with the power of your spirit. Word and spirit. Jesus, Father, you said that you're looking for those who will worship you in word and spirit. Lord, renew in us the full gospel of the kingdom, Lord. The full gospel, the glorious message. Lord, show us, teach us how to, Lord, how to be burdened with it, Lord, overwhelmed by that. Um, as Paul said, just com I'm, I'm compelled to share it. But Lord, it, it, not, not, as, not as just another philosophy or thing of help, but for what it is, it is the good news of the world, for the world. Holy Spirit, come. Overwhelm us as we prepare to come to your table, Lord. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us to be a thirsty people, Lord, so we can be conquerors, Lord. Yeah, come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus.